Good evening, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us on this weekday evening. I am Sri Lekha Pali, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. As Republican Party congressional primaries are coming up, I am continuing to focus on bringing in all our exemplary candidates to Conversations That Count so we get to know the candidates' positions on the issues that you and I care about. At Fairfax GOP, we are deeply committed to engaging all of our voters and constituents during this entire process. So if you have any questions for our candidate today, please post it on Facebook Live and I will try to get to all of them. Today, it is my honor to invite Monica, Monica Carpia. Ma Monica is running in eighth congressional district along with three other candidates. Monica lives in McLean with her husband, Jerry, and their two wonderful daughters. She holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Stanford and a master's degree in economics from Cornell. That makes Monica Ivy League economist very proud. <laughs> Monica has worked in the Federal Department of Labor for about eight years, as well as US Department of Commerce for about four years. Monica, welcome to Conversations That Count. I am glad you're here. Thank you so much, Sir Leica. I am so happy to be here. This is a great opportunity to share my ideas and about, to tell people about myself. Thank you so much. Excellent. Monica, let me first start by asking, what motivated you to run? I always wonder, I think that's like always my best question for the candidates. Why did you think you wanted to run for Congress? It's a pretty big position to start off the political life. Yes. Um, well, I was motivated to run um, at basically after the first three months of the pandemic. I was, I felt very disappointed in how politicians dealt with the pandemic. I thought that the individual rights of people were, were being taken away um, unreasonably, and I was very upset by the government overreach and by our little politicians. I was not very political before this. I always like to um, read what's, you know, read what, what's on the news and be well informed. However, I didn't know really who our local politicians were because I didn't really pay attention except for the, you know, like the governor, senators. Um, but that's when I started finding out about the school board members and about uh, other politicians like the congressmen in the area. And basically I became really involved in Virginia politics the last two years. So I'm doing this because I think that a lot of us need a voice. We're not really being represented by our congressmen at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Monica, I think those are wonderful reasons to run. A lot of candidates have seen how, how our country is shaping up in the last two years. But as we go along, I also would like you to talk about why Congress. I mean, uh, school board is coming up, supervisor is coming up. Uh, but I always like to understand that um, congressional position is a uh, position that's more of like, it does focus on local issues, but it focuses more on federal issues. But while you're talking about your issues, I would love to uh, you to elaborate that. So, uh, that's Monica, right. yeah. Monica, uh -huh. well, you... I'm... yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Monica. Well, I believe that with my life experience and my education, I could really make a difference. I've been living in the Beltway now for about more than 20 years, and I'm an economist inside the Beltway and outside the Beltway. I've lived overseas, and I've lived in various parts of our nation, uh, mainly in the West Coast and East Coast. And I have also lived in several parts of the 8th District, in Arlington, Alexandria, um, and Fairfax County. And I think that as a congresswoman, I could really um, make more of a difference than a more a local level, like school board or, you know, board of supervisors. I think that what happened during the pandemic was really terrible. What the politicians did, closing businesses, it really affected women and children in a very bad way. I mean, a lot of small business owners are women. And the school closures were really, really terrible for children. Um, also, look at the economy now. I mean, this is the after effect of having closed businesses and just printing money like crazy. This, you know, people, politicians, they just, they just, people can't be treated that way. I mean, it's really affected people's mental health, their, their 
their um, ability to um, their economy, their, their personal income. Um, so something has to be done. These politicians have to be removed. They have to basically um, change is needed. They have to retire. So that's why I want to retire by her. Monica, I think that is great motivation to run. I would love to understand about a buyer a little bit, a little bit more. But Monica, I know at first you were intending to run for um, 10th district because, but then redistricting happened and a lot of us got shuffled around. So voters are also in the mode of not understanding which district they belong to. It'll be great if you can elaborate that eighth congressional district boundaries, but I'm also very interested in knowing the demographics of eighth congressional district. Can you kind of hit on those two points? Yes. Um, so the eighth district is one of the smallest districts um, geographically, but because the population is so dense, it's in the upper corner by DC. It um, includes Arlington, Alexander, Falls Church, and parts of Fairfax County. Um, so I live in the 8th district, right, really close to the border with the 11th district. And 50% of the 8th districts, of the 8th district, I mean, I'm sorry, are ethnic minorities. And, um, and a large part of that are Hispanic people. And as you can probably tell, I am Hispanic myself. Um, my background, my, I was born in California. And my parents are South American from um, Peru. And my dad, my parents came here when they were like, my dad's 16, my mother 21. Um, and in their country, there's there's a large Asian population. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, especially Japanese and Chinese. Um, there was actually even one president who, um, um, Japanese Peruvian, Fujimori. And his daughter recently ran for president of Peru. Um, she lost, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, um, so I feel like I will be a good representative for the 8th district because at the moment there are 11 congressmen in um, Virginia and only four are Republican and uh, they're all men and there are no female Republicans. Now that might change because I'm pretty much sure that Jennifer Wixon is going to lose in the 10th district and she will probably lose to a to a woman, but is one female Republican Congresswoman enough in Virginia? I would say no. Besides, I would say that we should have an ethnic minority um, represent us the Republican Party because there's just a lot of us now. Um, and sure, um, I am not a seasoned public speaker. However, I'm not going to let that deter me from um, trying to do this because I feel like I'm qualified in other ways. I have the experience working for the federal government and also private industry. And I am also um, a parent, uh, I'm a mother of two children who attend public schools. So my children attend public schools. So I know what all these people that suffered during the pandemic with the public schools closures went through. I understand that because I am a parent that supported Governor Yunkin um, in his campaign. Um, and I also supported the um, school board recall effort um, with the other mostly mothers because um, there were lots of volunteers. There were some dads there, but it was mostly moms. So uh, moms need a voice. Conservative moms need a voice because there are three congresswomen from Virginia right now, Elaine Luria, uh, Abigail Spanberger, and Jennifer Wexton, but they're all um, Democrats. Sure. And sometimes sure. I just don't really feel like they're my voice in Congress because I am a conservative person. I believe, you know, in a family unit, I am not in, agree, in agreement with all these ideas, new ideas. Um, I don't think this, those subjects would be touched, touched upon in schools, like the gender identity issues, all that. I think that that's, those are conversations for adults only. So Monica, I truly, I truly believe your qualifications are good enough. I don't know if I would necessarily think we just need to put females or ethnic folks just to put them. But however, if they're qualified, I'm all for it. I think it's definitely a valuable thing to be to have that representation 
but I think your qualifications uh, are good enough to stay on the ballot. So I would love to focus on those qualifications. Uh, can you also elaborate on eight congressional district boundaries since there is redistricting that has happened recently? Where do your boundaries fall? Oh, yeah. So basically between McLean and Great Falls, um, parts of McLean are, um, most of McLean is eighth district and Great Falls is in the 11th district. Um, then um, Alexandria, Fort Hunt are in the 8th District, Monticello, uh, Falls Church, City of Falls Church are in the 8th District, um, Arlington is in the 8th District, so basically that. Got it. And then it works with the 7th District, I believe, with Manassas. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. So it's a lot of Alexandria, a lot of Arlington and stuff. Uh, so uh, Monica, I it's noted all of, that... it's, it's all of Arlington and all of Alexandria and all of Falls Church. Got it. Okay. So I know that uh, I, I am, da I'm a data person. I enjoy data myself. So I always slice and dice quite a bit. I know in, in eighth congressional district, there are about 18.5% Hispanic, which I think you alluded to that. That's about 150,000 people. And we also have black or African American, uh, which are about 112,000 people and close to 100,000 Asian American residents. Uh, so I know that as a, a Latino American, you can relate very well to Hispanic uh, community, so, but are you trying to engage black or African American and Asian communities? Because that would be a great strategizing diverse engagement. So are you trying yes. to kind of engage them? Yes, of course, of course I am. Um, currently, um, Virginia has two African American congressmen. And they, again, they're um, Democrats. I think their names are Bobby Scott, and I forgot the other gentleman's name. Um, but yes, of course, um, we want minorities that are conservative. Um, and this is changing. I mean, the Republican Party is changing. The, the Democrat Party is changing. Seems like everyone's kind of moving more towards the left, but the Democratic Party is moving, just gone way too far left. Um, you know, our, the whole... Our nation's demographics are changing. There are more and more uh, minorities, so uh, that's just going to change the um, the makeup of the uh, Congress. Mm -hmm. and other so, so, Monica, let me ask you, you, you did say that you are engaging these diverse voters. So when you're speaking to them, what are the top issues that are facing these communities? Is it any different than mainstream communities? In the sense I say, mainstream communities, yes, they're worried about critical race theory 100% of the time. They're worried about small businesses shutting down. They're worried about public safety. But is that what diverse communities like African-American communities, Asian communities, and Hispanic communities are also saying, or do they have different issues facing them? Well, I would say that a lot of issues are actually similar. I mean, all of the communities suffer with more crime. So, and also with bad schooling, you know, with, with schools closing, you know, with children being taught things that the parents don't really relate to. So that affects all communities. So, I mean, I don't really want to, I am, I wouldn't just be, a person representing minorities. I mean, I, I would be a person representing everyone. Um, so I think that that's one thing. I don't really want to be seen exactly as just like a minority person. I'm just an American. And um, some of these the issues right now are border control. Um, that's a really important issue to me because border control is super important because right now there's way too much illegal immigration and it's creating a problem with drugs, um, drugs in our youth, and crime, and over, over just, oh, just extraining our public systems, like our school systems, that affects everyone. So we have to do something about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, like you've never heard so much about carjackings and so sometimes the news sounds like we're in another country like South Africa or something. It was, I mean, this, this is not what happened before here. And I believe that people here, basically families are just strained. I mean, it's just so, it's so difficult for families just to like, basically 
to, you know, be able to meet their needs. I mean, a lot of a lot of families have to work two jobs just to be able to have appropriate housing for their children, and it shouldn't be that way. So there's a problem with immigration. There's too much illegal immigration in my mind, and I think that's affecting everyone. You know, not just the, the you know, not just minorities or not just the majority. So some issues are just affect everyone. I think you're 100% right, right? Issues are issues, regardless of where you fall. If schools are bad schools, they're bad schools for minority communities, they're bad schools for majority communities. Uh, I, I have to agree with that. Um, Monica, tell me something. On your website, I did see a vibrant and active website. I loved it. It's colorful. You had lots of pictures. And that just shows how much you are out there in the community, talking to Republicans, trying to understand their issues. But I, I, I still would like to you to elaborate on top three issues that you chose for your campaign. I, I believe you chose immigration, but I would love to hear more about the top three issues. And we can elaborate as we go along, but uh, can you name what those issues? Yes. Um, I, it was very important for me to, to have representation in Congress that values family, family issues, old fashioned values. Seems to me like in today's society, that's being de-emphasized the importance of family. Um, and I mean, it's, I think it's, it's good, you know, to be open-minded, to be, to accept people if they want to act a certain way. However, the family unit is very important and elderly people should be respected. So I think that in today's world, people are too rude. And I think that that has to change. Also, another issue which is very important to me is um, term limits in Congress. I think a lot of Congress people stay way too long in Congress and they just stop caring. Like, for example, our Congressman, Mr. Byer in the 8th District, I don't think that he really cares anymore. I mean, <laughs> he, he seems to me like he just says, oh, okay, the Democrat Party is a party of compassion, but what about the compassion of the people who vote, you know, in the 8th District? I mean, it just doesn't he doesn't make sense. I mean, he just cares about other people like foreign people instead of caring about the people who live here. I mean, when the schools were closed for two years, what about all the people who had to stay home with four or five children and all the little kids were screaming and the couples were fighting? I mean, doesn't, doesn't he care about that? And he says he cares about women. No, he doesn't care about women. If he cared about women, then, he, then he, people like him would have done something. Of course, he doesn't care because he's a millionaire. He is totally connected to um, the people he's supposed to represent. He had a bunch of car dealerships. He used to be an ambassador to Switzerland. He used to be lieutenant governor. I think he would be better off just being a diplomat. He, he's a classy guy. He should just, you know, just do that. But it doesn't, that doesn't really matter. He's not, he doesn't act like he's a congressperson. Yeah. Oh, so Monica, I think you brought up one good point where you said uh, he's been there for too long. I think uh, you're absolutely right. I say when you are even in a profession for too long with no growth in that profession or not doing different thing, you lose the passion for the job. I think that happens to best of the individuals. And you all, it also results in complacency. And complacency yeah. is not what our country needs. We need people that are energetic, that want to do good things, uh, that want to make policy changes. Monica, I do, I'm sure you know this, but I do want to bring it to your attention and the people that are hearing to attention. Congressman Don Beyer is serving his fourth term and he's in his 70s. I always say if this happens in corporate world or private sector, they will be retired, waving the path for new leaders, early careerists, because that's how the new ideas uh, and diversity of perspective and ideas come into picture. But I do want to ask. But for example, uh -huh. yeah. like look at look at the guy in the district next door, Jerry Conley. I think he's been there much longer, like thirty years or thirty-five years. Then there's, I think Bobby Scott's been there for the same, like thirty-five years. Uh, and right. the woman in D.C., um, Mrs. Congresswoman Norton, she's been there for like more than 35 years. Correct. I mean, I think that that's just way too long. 
there's a, a congressman in Alaska. He just retired or died. He'd been there for 49 years. 49 years. Yeah. I mean, that's a long time. That's why I think career so politicians, that, people make money, uh, uh, career politicians is not a great uh, thing for our country. So uh, Monica, let me ask you about Congressman Dyer, ba Don Byers policies. Again, as I said, I'm definitely into data and policies because I think that's where the meat of our discussion should focus on so we get the best out of understanding the ideas. He serves as the chairman of Congress Joint Economic Committee uh, and he yeah. also serves on the House Committees on Ways and Means and House Committee on Science, Space and Technology, where he actually chairs the space subcommittee. You're an economist yourself, which I think is a proud thing for a Republican candidate to have such fabulous background. So tell me, I mean, as he's serving the chairman of Congress's Joint Economic Committee, are there any part of his economic policy positions that you disagree with and you think you can do way better resolutions? Yeah, I mean, he wants to raise uh, the debt limit. I think that the government should stop spending so much money. They sp the government spends way too much money. The government should stop taxing. They should. Government should only tax the um, the one percent basically. They should stop taxing the middle class. I mean, the middle class have had enough. Gas prices are out of control. It's hard to even get to work. Food prices are up because of supply chain issues. So I, I think that the government spends way too much money. I mean, it's it's fine what they spend on defense. Um, but, for example, the U.S. Department of Education is superfluous because uh, the funding for the schools come from um, from state, uh, from the state and from uh, local taxes. The U.S. Department of Education is the third largest federal agency, and it mostly gives grants for um, higher, ed higher education. We need more tradespeople, not so many college graduates. I mean, you can't even find... Um, a reasonably uh, priced handyman nowadays, because everybody has, um, you know, a law degree. I mean, we don't need so many lawyers. We need more tradespeople. So that money uh, from uh, the U.S. Department of Education money should probably be used for other things, like, um, you know, relieving the um, the debt or maybe spending it on metal detectors or public schools to protect the children. No, I think yeah. that that's to be done. Well, uh, Monica, you obviously have some concrete policy differences between you and Don Bayer. I want to stick to federal debt because I also want to pick your brain on your, you being an economist and also our federal debt issue that's going on. As you know, it has become a large per percentage of GDP than it has ever been. Um, as a result, I mean, as every woman, man and child in our country now has a $90,000 government credit card bill, courtesy of uh, Don Byers work in the House of Ways and Means Committee and the Joint Economic Committee. I, I think this happened because Bayer thought it was okay when he voted to raise the federal debt limits. Have you ever asked uh, your congressman about this? I mean, um, I'm, I'm curious to know how, I know that debates won't happen until primaries are over, but I, I didn't know if you got a chance to ask him via town halls or through an email, I mean, uh, what kind of interactions if you had? If so, what was his response for raising such a large amount? No, I, I've never met Don Bayer, but I am planning to attend his women's conference uh, on Friday, May 6th. I want to see what he has to say. I want to see what he has to say a bit about issues like domestic violence or, um, you know, women's, women's um, you know, conditions in the workplace i mean why do women get paid less in general for the same kind of work than men do with the same kinds of degrees but most more than anything my issue is with he he says that he he protects he he cares about women so i mean why did why why was it okay for him to keep schools closed and businesses closed for so long i mean that that was just wrong it really affected women in a negative way so I do plan to go to that event, and I had planned to go to a debate he had with Victoria Verasing, which is who's the person who's running against him in the Democratic Party. But I was not able to go because I had to do something else today. However, I am planning to um, start going to his 
debates if I'm available because I have to go to events myself for my campaign. Sure. Um, but I do want I, I do want to um, start. I'm going to go to that on Friday. He's having a women's conference. I think it's at George Mason University on Friday at six. Excellent. I, I think the more we encounter these um, Democrat politicians, uh, any sitting politicians that have been there forever, the more we can bring up our issues. So, Monica, why yeah, because a lot, of, a lot of these politicians they just talk and talk and talk about how much they care. Da, 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 da. They can go for like an hour and just really not say anything. They just they just use fancy language. But I mean, why is why is um why is it so hard? Like every year, it gets harder and harder for the middle class American and middle class families to just you know get their their work done. I mean, why is it harder? So it doesn't matter how fancy people talk. I mean, how is it affecting families? I mean, the families are not even being respected. I mean, you had this guy like Terry McAuliffe saying, oh, I don't think parents should be able to tell people what to do. Like, you know, or, you know, it's just, how could he say that? I mean, that's just terrible. That's what, he, that was really silly of him, I think. That's Absolutely. what he lost. Absolutely, Monica. I was present during the debate and uh, I was pretty shocked myself. Monica, I mean, I think you, you started talking about it in your previous answer. I really want to grab onto that. You talked about women's rights. You talked about why are women's not, women not getting paid more? Although I think, uh, I, I think that is much more complex issue. There's uh, much yeah. more- Yeah, and also can I just say, I just wanna clarify something because I got an email for, from a couple of people the last few months. I guess when I said women's rights, they thought I was talking about you know abortion, but I, really, I wasn't. I was actually talking more about the issue of domestic violence. I mean, luckily, you know, I'm married to a man who's very nice. However, there's a lot of women out there who um, have a hard time and there's a lot of crime committed by men towards women, a lot. Like I see it on the news every single day. I mean, we need more laws that protect women, that protect children, that protect um, kids that go on uh, the uh, adopted children because a lot of adopted children are adopted by people who are not the right people who, to do that. So you, there, should, there should be like a national da database for um, children who are adopted, not just state databases, because sometimes the people who adopt the children, they don't treat them very well. So Monica, domestic so abuse is a real thing. Uh, I'm glad you kind of alluded to that. It is not just one of those social issues you can disregard. That is a real problem. I always say healthcare and affordability is a real problem. Prescription drug prices is a real problem. Domestic abuse is yeah. a real problem. Uh, affordable yeah, prescription. Yeah. I mean, like the medical, um, the whole pharmaceutical industry is just out of control. I mean, it's really hard for seniors to just get their medicines. I mean, they can't afford to get their medicines or even go to the doctor with the social security, you know, payment they get. It's it's hard. I mean, the whole medical industry is just it's just out of control. It's just too much red tape. It's it's just terrible. So things have to be simplified. It seems it seems to me like everything's so complicated. There's so many loopholes. There just needs to be more straight talk in government, you know. Monica, I know you briefly mentioned about social security. On your website, I reviewed the website. Uh, every time I try to sit with a candidate, I, pra I practically memorize everything that's on the website because it gives me an insight of what the candidate is thinking. On your website, you alluded to the fact that you'll start working on cutting weights from the budget and you'll start with 68 billion of fraud and abuse in Medicaid and Medicaid. I believe you also alluded a little bit to the social security too. So is there any data behind it? Is that, that, that is an astounding number, $68 billion of fraud. Where did you, I know you're an economist and I'm not. Um, so where did you get that number from? And also, can you elaborate on what kind of fraud are you talking about? Um, yeah, well, first of all, I, didn't, I don't do all my website work. I mean, I, there's a, I have a team of people who work on the website and the emails. I do post the social media myself, but I have also a lot of advisors, um, and these are people who actually I don't I don't pay. I just um, they're all volunteers, and they're great. Um, so they a lot of information 
you know, it's not just my work, but it's also other people's work. Um, yeah, so the fraud with that is basically, so a lot of people, the, the cost is so high because people come from other countries and they just come to the doctor here as if they have an accident or something, it, basically they get treated for free. And where does that money come from? From the taxpayers. So, I mean, there should be more control at the borders and more visa restrictions. Basically, I mean, I, I, it's not, it's not being mean, but people need to realize that this country is just, there's just basically no more space for people. It's just, it's just, there's just no more space or money. Things have changed. My parents immigrated here 50 years ago, but the situation has totally changed. So it's like, if you don't have any more money to give out, then don't. I, I agree with a candidate that's being criticized right now because he's saying that the United States should just shouldn't be spending so much money on foreign aid. Maybe the way he said it was a little rough, but I agree with, with what he says. I mean, I think that the Department of the Defense budget is fine, but the foreign aid is just out of control. I mean, we shouldn't be giving so much money to other countries when we need the money here. I mean, have you seen all the homeless people on the street? People who shouldn't even be homeless? They're even drugged? I mean, you can tell these people are not in their right mind sometimes. And then other people from other countries say, oh, all Americans do is work. Uh, well, yeah, because we're working for you guys, so you're just laying around in the sun or something. There's, I think that the foreign aid is just out of control. I mean, I will cut the USAID budget by half. Absolutely. Now, thank you for taking a strong stance on making sure there are stronger borders and federal debt is reduced. I think um, if you're the elected congresswoman and you live up to those promises, our children and grandchildren will thank you. So, yeah, we can't, really be, we, we can't be so extreme either to just cut all, you know, foreign aid because we need the diplomatic ties. No change is good when it's done so rashly. I mean, you have to change is best when it's done gradually. Yeah. However, um, also very strategically, right? You want to do it gradually, but you want to be very strategic. If any countries are really take our money and uh, put it for good use, as in like maintain strong borders, maintain national defense, and uh, t take care of their people from a humanitarian grounds is great. But if they're going yeah, to- Yeah, and also I, 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 think, I think that other countries should solve their own problems. I mean, why are we always solving other people, other countries' problems? We have our own problems, so we have to fix our own problems first. America first, I mean, I agree with that. Yeah, I'm not gonna be using a lot of terms, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be cliche and just repeat what other politicians say because I'm not really a politician. Like like Governor Youngkin said, he really wasn't a politician, he was a businessman. And you know, I'm basically, I'm an economist, but I'm also a mother, I see myself as a mother. However, yeah, now I'm trying to be a politician and I don't want to use the same terms like woke and all, but I mean, you know, I agree with, I basically agree with the Republican creed, with the Republican values. And I think that I don't want to just you tell me if you want me to change the subject, but I think I'm the best candidate for the eighth district because I think that I have a good chance of being buyer because it doesn't really matter like if he's a seasoned public speaker or he's a millionaire, it doesn't matter. He doesn't connect with the people. People are unhappy. And the two, um, the two, guys who are running, the two men who are running with me in this race, they're great people, I like them both. However, they already lost against Mr. Byer. They only got like 25% of the vote or 30% of the vote. And then I'm running against two women who are also very, very nice, talented people. They're very smart women. And one of them is a mother as well. She, she has four children. However, I think that the, one of them is too conservative. I'm more of a centrist like Mr. Youngkin. And the other one doesn't really understand what it what it takes to raise a family. She doesn't understand like how hard it is. Uh, I, when I became a mother and a wife, it changed my life, especially when I became a mother. So I think that she's too young to be a congressperson. So um, Monica, uh, let me also stick to, your po to policy questions. And I'm glad, I think as we went along, I did want to ask you about your winning primary strategies and so on and so forth. I'll get to that. But let me ask you a policy question. I am sure you're aware that when Fairfax County Public Schools revoked the Thomas Jefferson's colorblind merit-based application process, they did that in December 2020 in favor of hybrid system with bonus points 
assigned to non-academic factors. What are your thoughts on it? One of the reasons I'm very interested in knowing your thoughts is because I believe TJ falls in your congressional district. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I applaud Astra Nomani's efforts, you know, to counteract the whole CRT and the whole admissions, you know, like change in the admissions process for TJ. I, I think that she's doing a good job with that and with that effort because, yeah, it shouldn't change. It shouldn't be, I don't think there should be any quotas. I mean, look, I probably benefited from that, I guess, with my um, getting into Stanford maybe because I'm a, a minority. However, I don't really, I don't think that people should be given any, any favors or anything because it's just, it just creates like, it's too much pressure on everyone and it's just not right. It should just be uh, based on like academic achievement. The admission should be based on academic achievement because that was the whole purpose of having a special school. It doesn't just, so I think it's wrong. I think that the TJ should just be what it was before and just admit people, kids with the highest grades. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, meritocracy is the key. It just, and also, it just, it, it, it's not doing any service to Hispanic or, or, or the African-American or Hispanic community because then it just creates a negative sentiment towards those communities. Absolutely, and also I think, uh, I always say Hispanics, Black, doesn't matter the color, they're all equally capable. They're all very smart, very bright children. I've been um, part of PTAs and in and out of schools all the time because I do have two uh, kids. I mean, I don't think um, the intelligence has anything to do with any any color. It's like all of them are smart. Yeah, and, and also, also Sri Lanka, I, I think that there are several kinds of intelligences, not just, you know, math and reading. There's also musical intelligence, um, which some ethnic groups seem to excel more than others. Like African Americans are usually better singers. I mean, and they're very good at athletics. So there's there's athletic intelligence. There's, there's I think there's like seven kinds of intelligences, artistic intelligence. So you know, I don't see why things have to change so much so fast and you know just create friction among the ethnic groups. I think that. You know, I, I, I think that Astra Nomani is doing a good job with that. Uh, uh, Monica, I wish you would speak on school board and say the exact thing, because intelligence means that you just don't have to just be good in math and science, right? Actually, growing up, I was never good in math at all. I was very good in science and biology. So I chose to become a healthcare professional and not an engineer. So I, do, I, I don't have to be an engineer in order to thrive. I can do what I'm good at. And I'm sure you are too. I mean, there is a reason you would have chosen to be economist. I said I could never get into a New York University of Arts because that's not my expertise. And it's okay. It doesn't make us any small of an individual. It's just focusing on the, the thought. Monica, on your website, I saw you writing and I, I just really, I, I would love to get some clarification. It says you support workers' right to a safe workplace. What, what do you mean exactly when you say workers' right to safe workplace? Oh, yes, because, uh, well, I, I probably was referring to um, that there should be more metal detectors at workplaces um, because there's been a lot of incidents of, um, you know, like mass shootings in the last years. So I was probably referring to that. I'm a big proponent of metal detectors at, um, at um, workplaces with, um, you know, a large number of employees. Uh, so, oh, so Monica, I know you spoke a bit about your candidate, about your other candidates, uh, which is for, which is great. But what is your uh, strategy for winning primaries? Because at the end of the day, you need to beat other four candidates in order to become a, a primary candidates, congressional candidates. So, what's your strategy? You don't have to share your home secrets, but would love to understand the grand strategy. Um, is it registering more delegates? I know that is closed in eighth district, but what's your strategy for winning primaries? Okay, well, yeah, delegates, uh, I'm trying to, uh, um, you know, go out to, out to delegates, like, you know, going to the house door knocking via phone bank as well, um, trying to listen, trying to write back when they write me emails, um, trying to get to know them by going to all the events and forums. I try to attend all the forums, um, and I think that's important because it's different than just you know, reading your statements or just calling in. 
I did call in once because I had to go see my parents in Florida. However, it's better to go in person. So some people are not going in person, um, but most of us are. Anyway, um, I basically the delegates have to ask themselves: Do we really want Don Baya removed? Because it's possible if you elect someone like myself. Yeah, I might not be. You know, I might not be the classic politician. However, I really, I'm really good with people. People just like me for some reason. They feel comfortable with me. You know, I don't know. Maybe because I don't lord it over uh, them. Like you know, all my skills and life experience, just the way I am. They just like me. That's why I have so many volunteers, and that's why people are just really passionate about me. They just, I don't know why. I mean, yes, maybe I'm showing off a little now, but that's just the way it is. So if they, if, if people in the 8th District really want change, if they really want Don Bio removed, then they should vote for me. Because I speak Spanish, and I'm going to launch a campaign in Spanish. Um, and also, I feel very comfortable with the Asian community. Uh, I have, I have very, com I'm very comfortable with the international community. I grew up partly overseas. And um, so I got to experience different cultures. I actually even lived in Central America in a large, there's a large Central American population here in the 8th District. Mm -hmm. And in my years at university, I had many friends, many um, Asian friends, particularly Indian friends, um, because of where I went to school. There's a large um, Asian um, population in these schools, a lot of because they're very studious. That's just the, that's just the truth. I mean, they have a good education system in those countries, or they come here. The best come here to study at, at the universities that I attended. So, you know, I feel very comfortable with them, and I think that that's really going to help me to um, beat Don Buyer because Don Buyer is just disconnected. Yeah, sure, he goes. Maybe he goes to the mosque or something once a year, but you know, he doesn't. He doesn't really relate to the people. The people don't. You know, they don't relate to him. Monica, I, I think I have to agree with you. On an average, research shows that Asian kids put in close to six hours more than an average American kid. Uh, Asian Americans put in extraordinary amount of uh, time into their education. So th that could be part of the reason why they're successful. It's not that any Asian American are born brilliant. All of them put in amazing, amazing amount of uh, hard work to get where they are. So uh, Monica, tell, um, uh, tell me something in the last time, I mean, we are coming almost to the end of the program. So um, I was curious to know, since you mentioned about Asia, Asian Americans, May is Asian American month. Uh, I want you to comment on two things. One is there is a lot of this Asian American hate going on. It could be the news, news media exaggerating, or it could be the real thing. I mean, recently, even as of today, one of my friends sent an article that stated that Asian American hate uh, crimes are going up in DC area. First thing, I would love to know your thoughts. But second thing is, uh, I know Eden Center is in um, eighth district too. Uh, and Eden yeah. Center is um, a hub for Asian American voter mobilization. So do you interact with them? How is your collaboration with them in order to ensure um, uh, our people have a voice? Yes, uh, yes, I have gone there and I have met um, several business owners. In fact, I got a contribution for from one of the business owners there um, that I know of because I haven't checked. I don't check it every day, um, so I might have gotten more. But I, ha I have interacted, and yes, I think that there is um, there is some anti-Asian um, sentiment that have been has been going around, especially since the pandemic, because the virus was um, said, you know to be started in China, so obviously obviously that's why. And I think that Asian Americans have to deal with that, which is really hard for them. However, you know, I, I mean, I, I actually follow this this um, one talk show person on TV. I don't think that you know who she is because um, people in DC are so serious and, you know, me too, I'm a very serious person. However, I like to follow people who are not as serious. Her name is Jenny May. She's actually a fashion fashionista and also a talk show hostess. And she's Asian American. She has like millions of followers. And she talks about this a lot in her show. It's called The Real is for Women Talking. 
Um, so I can see definitely that, you know, Asian Americans have to deal with this sentiment of feeling like, you know, they're, they're not American, that they're from China, that all these things that are said about them. So it's hard. I mean, it's hard for minorities sometimes to just try to just fit in, you know, because, and also on television, minorities are not really represented as well. And I just, it's, it's hard. So Asian Americans and all other minorities have to try harder to fit in and it's hard, but people just don't really understand that. It, and also it looks bad to complain because people don't like that. So a lot of people just have to just not say anything just to be accepted. Um, and I hope to change that because that's why I want to, I'm running for Congress too, because I, I feel like if people see someone that looks like them and like talks like them a little, then they will feel more comfortable and more self-confident. Absolutely, Monica. Representation does matter. I always say I believe in representation as long as they're qualified candidates. I think for me, meritocracy and qualifications, America first, being pro-American uh, plays a major role. But, uh, you, uh, but I have to agree with you, representations do matter. Makes you feel a little more warm and welcome into an environment when you see somebody that looks like you, talks like you, and so on and so forth. So Monica, tell me, um, uh, this might be a good time to tell our registered delegates. I know that only registered delegates can come to the convention in 8th Congressional District, but a lot of people are always confused about ranking choice order, and also where do they come and vote and what date? Yes. Um, the convention is May 21st. It's at the Waterford Convention Center, and it's important to be there by 8 o'clock. Um, but if you're running late, that's okay. It goes from 8 to 11 a.m. And um, I believe the candidates were, were going to speak there. Um, my, my team's going to be there. I'm going to be there. Um, I'm going to be there to answer any questions that people have and talk about you know, what is important to people. Um, I think that the question that the delegates have to ask themselves again is who, who would I prefer to be my congressperson, uh, Monica or Don Beyer? Because if they don't choose me, it's gonna be Don Beyer again. I don't really see how any of the other, the two, the two um, gentlemen who are running now, they already lost against Mr. Beyer by a lot. And the two females besides me who are running one of them is too young and she is not a parent and i don't think that she will beat mr buyer and the other one is very nice too but she's very conservative and this is a very kind of either centrist or liberal district so i don't think that she could be mr buyer then there's me i'm a centrist person and i i feel very connected to mr duncan i really like him and he knows me he can set, has told me that he can't endorse anyone until after the primary, but if I want, he would endorse me. So who would the, dele the delegates have to ask themselves, would I be better off with Monica, who's a novice, or with Don Bayer, who is doing what, he's just gonna keep doing what he's doing. Whereas I would work closely with Congressman um, Whitman, first of all, then Congressman Good and Congressman Klein and Cong Congressman Griffith, you know, I, I will be basically learning from them and I will work well with them. Yeah. Monica, I think that is a, a compelling argument. Uh, um, uh, although I think uh, sometimes uh, centrist uh, might not um, help out the conservative causes, but, I, uh, but you are in a district where a lot of folks do belong to that uh, centrist, their right centrists are left centrist and so on and so forth. So I understand where your position is coming from. So Monica, in the last few minutes, uh, uh, please tell our viewers if I missed anything, because I always say, I want to ask candidates all questions. I want to understand their education policy. I want to understand their pro-life. I want to understand their Second, uh, Second Amendment rights. I want to understand about their uh, federal experience with regards to social security trust funds, multiple things, but you can only capture so many. But if you feel that I'm just asking something uh, related to policy that you're like, boy, I really want my audience or my voters to know, this would be the best time. Yeah. Well, 
I want to say that if I were elected, I would use my Spanish skills at the border. I would travel with Congressman Good to the border. I, I would ask to accompany him to try to, um, you know, clear up any miscommunications there are there, because this is a really serious issue that's affecting everything, our economy, crime, education. The border, for me, is the number one issue. I mean, border control is the number one issue. And... You know, I'd be there with Congressman Good. He's already gone there a time. There's um, this, uh, government, I mean, sorry, Governor Abbott from Texas. He's a Republican. I don't know if you know about him. Um, the poor guy's actually disabled. He had a horrible accident when he was very young. Um, he He's a Republican, and I agree with most of the things that he does, obviously. However, I don't like the fact that he's sending these buses over here, like it's on the, we're on the eighth bus here, and we don't need any more illegal immigrants here in D.C. He's trying to make a point, and he's making it. We need to fix up the border control issue because it's affecting us here in Virginia. So we need to fix that. It's not just affecting the whole country. And also, I just want to say that um, I want to get to know the delegates better, and that's why I'm having a barbecue this Mother's Day at my home in McLean, and the delegates obviously don't have to pay. They're invited so they can get to know me and my family better. I hope that everyone has a chance to look at my website, which is just my name, monicacarpio.com, where I have many pictures because uh, pictures tell a thousand words in one quick minute. So pictures sometimes are better than words. I have many pictures of uh, my family, my friends, my volunteers, politicians that I like and have met um, in the last couple of years. So um, please go on my website, monicacarpio.com, and just let me know what you think. I, I, I like to receive emails because I, I take into account um, all kinds of opinions. Thank you so much. Monica, thank you for Bye. joining us. Uh, this, was a, this was a great conversation, and I wish you the very best in primaries. You made a case to our voters of why you're the best candidates. You also made a case about the issues, whether we agree or disagree, your, your, you laid out to our voters and now voters will choose the best candidate. You are, if you are the chosen candidate, hope you come by uh, again after your primary so we can do a deep, deep dive into many issues that are plaguing our country and in particular eighth congressional district. Uh, I wish you the very best. And uh, um, I always say that may the best candidate win. And uh, I just have no um, doubt that with all the enthusiasm and spirit that our candidates have, you're out there all the time, door knocking, strategizing, working with our constituents and everything will pay off. So viewers, you heard Monica Carpia, she's running for eighth congressional district. Please go to her website. Uh, consider volunteering, consider uh, your donations. I always say time, talent, and treasure are the most important things for candidates. Uh, I wish you take the time to at least dedicate one of those to our candidates. And uh, you hold Monica's positions. If you agree with her, please consider going to her website. Uh, couple of announcements this coming Friday at 6 p.m. on Conversations That Count. I am going to have Z Van Fleet. Uh, Z uh, grew up in China during the height of Mao's Cultural Revolution. And Z, compelled by her personal experience during, during this Chinese cultural re revolution and the realization that what she's experienced in China is now taking place within the United States. So she has committed herself to warn the American people and help them see, help us see what is currently happening in our school system and in society in general. So you would love that conversation. May is an Asian American month. And I wanted to definitely open with our candidate, Monica Carpio. It's very important we get our candidates information, but I also wanted to bring in our Chinese American that can speak about Asian American month. On Saturday at uh, May 7th at 6 p.m., we will have another candidate, Captain Hang Kao. He's a congressional candidate running for 10th district. I hope you continue to tune in, continue to support our candidates that are putting their family life out there. Monica has two beautiful children and the husband, from my understanding, your husband is writing a third book on cybersecurity, which is, I think is phenomenal. So, uh, I mean, people are putting their personal time and effort. So I hope you consider voting for the right candidate and coming out and supporting them. Continue to tune in to learn about our candidates. Uh, this will be posted on YouTube. So if you missed a part of it, please go into YouTube and understand Monica's positions. 
Please don't forget to subscribe to Fairfax GOP and share these videos far and wide. Our candidates don't have the name recognition that millionaire, like Monica was saying, Congressman Don Beyer, who has been in Congress for multiple terms, have it. So our candidates really need that exposure that they need and deserve. So please do that. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful evening. God bless you Thank all. You. God bless the candidates. Take care.